In this chapter, we're going to be looking at the Tang and Sung dynasties, and I will take five big picture questions from this section and discuss them with you. The first big question that we have is, in what ways did the Tang and Sung dynasty resemble the classical Han dynasty period, and in what ways had China changed? Tang and Sung Dynasty China resembled the Han Dynasty period in a number of ways, including the maintenance of an imperial political system and the importance of a professional bureaucracy formally trained and subject to competitive exams. Also similar was a focus on establishing a dominant political position in East Asia that was recognized by China's neighbors, and interest also in and support for long-distance trade, and continued importance of the Confucian tradition in elite society. China also experienced important changes following the Han Dynasty period, including tighter unification of northern and southern China through a vast waterway system, the long-term migration of Chinese population south into the Yangtze River Valley in 220 in the Common Era, and also an economic revolution that made it the richest empire on earth. And finally, there was a rapid population growth from about 50 million to 60 million people during the Tang Dynasty to about 150 million people by the year 1200, uh, which was spurred in part because of the remarkable growth in agricultural production. Uh, also, the economy of China became the most high commercialized in the world and became more active in long-distance trade than they did during the Han Dynasty. The second big question is how would you respond to the idea that China was a self-contained or isolated civilization? In looking at that, many developments noted uh, in the chapter in your book, including China's active participation in long-distance trade, the tribute system which established ties with China's neighbors, and the influence of Buddhism on Chinese societies. Also contradicting this idea are the popularity for a time during the Tang Dynasty of Western barbarian music, uh, dancing, clothing, food, games, and artistic styles among the upper classes, and the influence of pastoral nomadic peoples on China. And then also contradicting would be the spread of Chinese technological innovations to other parts of the world. China's adoption of outside crops and technology, including uh, cotton, sugar, and the processing techniques for these crops from India, as well as fast ripening rice from Vietnam, and the cosmopolitan nature of China's port cities contradict the notion that China was really isolated. However, in defense of the idea, one could point to the perception of the educated Chinese elite that China was self-sufficient, requiring little outside help. Uh, the third question is, in what different ways did nearby peoples experience their giant Chinese neighbor, and how did they respond to it? China's neighbors did not experience China in one uniform way, but in general, nearby peoples uh, experienced their Chinese neighbors as a trade partner, a cultural influence, and political influence as well. China could also, at times, be a military threat. Some neighbors, such as Korea and Vietnam, experienced China as a military conqueror. Others, such as pastoral peoples of North China, were at different times both the conquerors and the rulers of parts of China and subject to attack by the Chinese. And Japan really had no military conflict with China. In the response to China, neighbors such as Korea and Vietnam and sometimes the pastoral peoples of Japan and Japan as well, participated in the tribute system that was promoted by China. Some, such as Japan, voluntarily adopted Chinese intellectual, cultural, and religious tradition. Other neighbors, such as Vietnam, both willingly adopted some Chinese intellectual, cultural, and religious traditions and had others imposed upon them while under Chinese rule. Uh, responses to Chinese influence will be varied from outright rebellion in Vietnam under the Trung sisters to the active embrace of Chinese influence by the Japanese under the Shotoku Taishi uh, regime. Big question number four is how can you explain the changing fortunes of Buddhism in China? Well, Buddhism first grew in influence in China during the period of disorder following the collapse of the Han Dynasty, a time when many in China had lost faith in Chinese systems of thought. 
Buddhism also benefited from the support of foreign nomadic rulers who, during this time period, governed portions of northern China. Once established, Buddhism grew for a number of reasons. Buddhist monasteries provide an array of social services to ordinary people. Buddhism was associated with access to magical powers. Uh, there was a serious effort by Buddhist monks and scholars to present this Indian religion in terms that the Chinese could relate to. And under the Sui and Tang dynasties, Buddhism received growing state support. However, it declined during the 9th century because some perceived the Buddhist establishment as a challenge to imperial authority. There was also a deepening resentment of the enormous wealth of the Buddhist monasteries. Buddhism was seen as offensive to some Confucian and Taoist thinkers because Buddhism was clearly of a foreign origin and because the practices of Buddhist monks undermined the ideal of the family. Imperial decrees in the 840s ended up shutting down Buddhist monasteries and the state ultimately confiscated Buddhist resources. Big question number five is how did China influence the world beyond East Asia? And tagging on to that, how was China itself transformed by its encounter, encounters with a wider world? Well, Chinese products, especially silk, were key to the Afro-Eurasian trade network. Chinese technologies, including those related to shipbuilding, navigation, gunpowder, and printing spread to other regions of Eurasia. Uh, Buddhism from South Asia had a profound impact on China. China's growing trade with the rest of the world made it the richest country on earth. It also became the most highly commercialized society in the world, with regions especially in the south producing for wider markets than rather than local consumption. China adopted cotton and sugar crops and the processes for refining them in South Asia. Mm -hmm.